children in council care were exploited by paedophiles and drug pushers and that some of the girls worked as prostitutes. The allegations published in the Evening Standard have been strongly denied by the leader of Islington Council. Amanda Harper reports. This is one of the homes at the centre of abuse allegations made by the Evening Standard. In its investigation, it cites a catalogue of child abuse, drugs and prostitution, with pimps and pushers allowed free access to youngsters in care. Islington Social Services is accused of ignoring pleas of experienced staff and children to take action and of gross mismanagement. The report alleges that it was at homes like this one behind me that children were exposed to drugs and prostitution. It says the over-liberal regime put girls at risk and as the home spiralled out of control, the pimps and the paedophiles moved in. The cases featured in the standard include that of a 15-year-old girl who, within a week of entering a home, fell in with a pimp and a drug pusher. She talks of being stoned for months and describes how she was forced into prostitution. The second is also the story of a boy who says he was sexually abused over many years by a residential worker at his home. The man used to give him alcohol and cigarettes and was allowed to take him away at weekends. A former social worker with Islington says his complaints about staff at one home were dismissed out of hand by management. Basically they wanted me to go away. They, they were totally uncooperative, which I found quite astonishing given the you know, the weight of the um, allegations I was making. But the Evening Standard allegations have been strongly refuted by the leader of Islington Council. I am appalled by the gutter journalism which the Evening Standard has chosen to exploit. Much of their evidence is based on the evidence of a man whom Islington Council sacked for alleged gross sexual misconduct and I would question whether or not those uh, his word should be taken seriously. Criticism that she failed to act has led to continued calls for her resignation. David Grossman reports. Margaret Hodge has been under pressure to resign as Children's Minister more or less ever since she was appointed. The charge against her that she failed to act to investigate allegations of child abuse in Islington Children's Homes. She was leader of the council during the 80s. These are all charges she denies, but the questions continue to be asked. An investigation by the BBC's Today programme interviewed Demetrius Panton. He suffered appalling abuse in an Islington care home in 1978. He says that when he tried to get help subsequently, he was not taken seriously by the council. In an effort to get the BBC to drop its investigation, Margaret Hodge wrote to the chairman of the BBC governors and other senior figures in the corporation, attacking Demetrius Panton. Mr. Panton is an extremely disturbed person who suffered from child abuse in Islington homes in his youth. Alan Levy QC has pursued child abusers through the courts for the past 20 years. It's very disturbing and I'm worried about the fact that a person in her position has made such a serious error of judgment, and particularly somebody who is there to uh, and it was advertised as being there to provide for the welfare and protection of children. She's completely misunderstood how one should approach and how one should deal with um, someone who is a serious victim of sexual abuse. Today, threatened by Mr Panton with a lawsuit, Mrs Hodge sent him this letter. I would like to apologise unreservedly for using the words as an extremely disturbed person with reference to you. I assure you I will not repeat those words again. I know you suffered appalling abuse in the 1970s when you were young and vulnerable from the very people who should have protected and cared for you. This afternoon, speaking alongside his solicitor, Mr Pandon said the apology was not enough. I've experienced quite a lot of, quite a lot of um, sad things in my life. And I know the difference between a genuine apology, an apology which is based as a consequence of legal and political expediency. And this apology, whilst I welcome and acknowledge it, I think is perhaps in the latter category. What Mr Panton seeks is a public statement of apology, a contribution to a children's charity of his choice, and the payment of his legal costs, which he would not have had to incur 
but for um, this unfortunate matter. Mrs. Hodge has been made aware of these requirements and she's been told that provided these requirements are met, um, my client is willing to have an end to the matter. Liz Davis was a social worker in Islington while Margaret Hodge was council leader. She says the minister should now resign. The message to all children out there is very, very dangerous because if they begin to want to talk about abuse they're suffering, they've got an image of a government who might well label them disturbed and I think that's very, very dangerous for children in this country. Margaret Hodge has come a long way from her days here at Islington Town Hall. When she ran the place, it had a reputation for chaotic left-wing radicalism. Now she's regarded as one of the most loyal of new Labour ministers. But for how much longer? The last time her past flared up over the summer, the government had to postpone a major announcement on child protection. So this time, she really needs the issue to go away for good because recent history tells us that ministers who are unable to go out in public and make speeches don't tend to last very long. Margaret Hodge, as she was in 1986, some doubt whether she will ever truly be able to put her Islington days behind her. The history of what happened at Islington won't go away. There are a number of people and, and organisations who I'm sure are determined to pursue it. And I, I think not unfairly. I don't think uh, Margaret Hodge um, is being victimised in any way or made a scapegoat for anything. She's exercised very bad judgment, in my view, and it simply isn't going to go away. It isn't going to dissipate. Um, people are not going to pat her on the head and say, oh, you've apologised, uh, everything's fine. Um, it's too serious, in my view. Margaret Hodge clearly enjoys being a government minister. At the moment, she enjoys the Prime Minister's full support. Sources close to her tonight are saying that she's considering offering a fuller and more public apology, a charitable donation and the legal expenses, all of which Mr Panton is demanding. However, the same sources say her resignation is not up for the... Where did the council officers go who were responsible for the abuse? Where did the council officers go in terms of transparency? Where did they go? What work did they do? Were they working with children? Dame Margaret Hodge is a seasoned Member of Parliament who has held a number of high-profile government positions in the four-plus decades that she's been a politician. She's been viewed as a warrior spearheading transparency and accountability in government by heading a Parliamentary Standards Committee and her latter-day media portrayal and role in public life sees her as the nation's saviour fighting for the underdog. Added to which, she is a seasoned pro on the talking circuit and has led numerous lectures and speeches from the position of having high standards of moral integrity and authority. But while Margaret Hodge has demanded transparency and accountability from others, she has not always been so forthcoming herself. Her history as leader of a North London council for a decade through the 80s and during a period when social workers met with her to tell her of the systemic sexual abuse of children in care is well documented, as is her stunning lack of action. Following her time as leader of Islington Council, her friend and political ally Prime Minister Tony Blair appointed her to the newly created role of Minister of State for Children. In 2003, the outcry was immediate. The Conservatives are calling for the sacking of Margaret Hodge, as the ch country's first children's minister, saying people could have no confidence in her abilities to protect them. Ms Hodge was head of Islington Council during the early 1990s. During that time, it's alleged she knew of but failed to stop cases of sex abuse to the children in the council's care. But Margaret Hodge, an adept politician, had been even quicker to denounce the accusations when they had first surfaced. I am appalled by the gutter journalism which the Evening Standard has chosen to exploit. But the children's minister went further and she deemed the children involved, including Demetrius Panton, now a successful lawyer, of being seriously disturbed in an attempt to stop the BBC from investigating the scandal. Later, Hodge was forced not only to admit her failings and to apologise to the Islington children, but in a stunning twist of the abused child becoming a powerful opponent in his own right, Hodge was also forced to pay Demetrius Panton £10,000 for libeling him.
A decade on and Margaret Hodge claimed she had been naive and that information had been kept from her, but that is far from a satisfactory conclusion for the remaining survivors and those who were tortured and even murdered. Dame Hodge has benefited from the protections of being a government minister and has systematically refused to be more transparent about what had taken place in Islington during the 80s and 90s. That's the way that I see that as being part of that. And advisors, again, would be held to account if we had transparency. If we had transparency. But, but that's not happening because people are not talking. Everybody's just shutting down. These people in the government. So historic um, sexual abuse cases are not being addressed unless they're for Westerns and people like Cliff Richard and stuff. But not for the little people that have been left behind. Yeah. And one I'm trying to help, who's just absolutely in despair. Keep Winterburn here, that's not been followed through. People from the government have not been following through. People from the police department have not been following through. No, this is not Parliament, but this is things you need to be aware of. Check out these LinkedIn survivors, because they're not surviving, they're just existing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, dying. Yeah. I'm one. I don't know if you want to say anything more, but we must move on to other questions, because we haven't got much time. Um, yeah. Where did the council officers go who were responsible for the abuse? Where did the council officers go in terms of transparency? Where did they go? What work did they do? Were they working with children? Well, I'm really happy to talk to these people outside here, but I think, you know, um, if you've got a, a, an issue you want to discuss, you can talk about it. Will there be redress? Yep, 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 I agree. I asked Leslie Woodburn why she was so insistent on asking Dame Margaret Hodge about council workers. Hodge has always claimed uh, that the council officers misled her. The council officers hid information from her, okay? If the council officers hid information and they, they uh, resigned from their positions, did they go on to work for other councils, um, uh, work with children, and mislead other council officials over um, uh, over child abuse? You know, did they move on to Rotherham, for instance? Did they move on to Rochdale? Did they go over to Lambeth? Did they go over to Hackney? Did they, were they did they even get council references? You know, in terms of their job, you know, to uh, 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 when they moved on. So yes, that was a that was behind my questioning of Hodge that of Hodge on that night. Well, I'm really happy to talk to these people outside here, but I think you know. Um... Where is the accountability and transparency? I found it ironic that Dame Margaret Hodge MP was giving a lecture on accountability and transparency in government. And yet, when faced with Islington survivors asking questions, asking for accountability, what does she say? We can have a private discussion afterwards. Where's the accountability there? At which point, I think, I need you to leave. I think that survivors in general are used to feeling unheard. So quite often we can be slightly nauseous than other people, which um, sort of feeds into their idea that we're messed up and, and, and very needy. But obviously it's an emotional topic. Um, abuse is an emotional topic. And there has been clear, blatant disregard for survivors. As always with Margaret Hodge, survivors have once again been left with the sense that the transparency she so talks about does not apply to her. What is clear is that there is more to be revealed about the child abusers who resided in Islington. Certainly, a number of pro-paedophile groups had links and influence with politicians in Margaret Hodge's era in the London borough. This included former Islington councillor Sandy Marks. Again, this was denied until the local press, the Islington Gazette, doggedly pursued this and forced admission from the council. I spoke with Liz Davis this week, the whistleblower social worker at the heart of the story and who is still fighting for justice for those who were abused. She is still living with decades of being demonised, threatened and denied. 
Despite this, Dr Davis is still working with survivors from Islington's dark past and has evidence from over 200 survivors. Her investigations have now expanded from 12 Islington children's homes to 50. For while Margaret Eve Hodge has enjoyed a celebrated career, enjoying the finest that life has to offer, she left behind her a living nightmare for the working class children she failed. Children who had already been handed a difficult start in life and the politician, so keen to point the finger at others, had added to their burdens. Almost 30 years on and Dame Margaret Hodge has yet to fully answer to them. Let me take you back to the moral judgment that you talk about. And I know that you've had to, uh, you've been asked this many times uh, in the past, I'm sure you've had to reflect on the tax bill of your family business. You say that that uh, business pays every penny that it owes in tax. You're very confident of that. But that's only 0.01%, £163,000 revenue for more than £2.1 billion in 2011. So how can we make the comparisons between your company and companies like Starbucks and Google? Or is there no comparison at all? There is absolutely no comparison to be made whatsoever. And I suggest you send your staff away to do a detailed look and see whether or not the company of which I'm a shareholder, I'm not, a, I'm not in any way involved in the day-to-day -day business of it, does not pay the fair share of tax according to the profits they make on the business they undertake in the UK. They do, Google doesn't. OK, but given that you are a shareholder, do you accept then that the first responsibility of any company is to its shareholders? I accept that the res well, I have to tell you, I, as a shareholder of the company, the one thing I have done is absolutely make sure that in the way that company is run, they pay a fair share of their tax and they pay the proper tax according to the business they undertake in the UK and the profits they make from that business in the UK. But 0.01% so doesn't sound like a lot, does it? But 0.01% doesn't sound like a lot. You're yeah, comfortable you're, with I that. Think I would suggest to you, I'm not, I'm not, I told you, I'm not, I don't, I haven't, you know, I don't have any dealings with the company on day to day. What they have assured but me of. But you did say what that you were confident that every penny that should be paid in tax was paid in tax. Yes. You've obviously looked into it. Yes. Okay. I'm confident. And 0.01% is enough? No, it isn't 0. Point. It's, a, it's what they pay, what they pay relative to the profits they make on the business they transact in the so UK. So how much is that as a percentage of tax? I, I, I mean, I can't give you that answer. But you did but say that every penny into... that was paid was paid in tax, so presumably you have the figures. Sorry? You did say that every penny they should pay I, in tax they is paid. Pay, I, I also said to you, I don't work for that business. I'm a shareholder. I think you should ask the, the, the company if you have any... All I can tell you is that everybody's trawled over this uh, and everybody from private eye onwards uh, uh, would, would agree with what I've said. And furthermore, when uh, one or two newspapers try to say otherwise, uh, they had to retract and uh, give a full apology. So I am absolutely confident that what I'm saying is the truth. OK. You know, it's become a convenient way to say avoidance is OK, evasion is not. And I don't think avoidance is OK. Just exploiting the inevitable ambiguities in the tax law simply to avoid paying taxes, no other purpose but to avoid paying taxes, is morally reprehensible and wrong. On the day that I heard that they were going to discipline me and possibly suspend me, it felt almost like I kept thinking, what did it feel like to be a Jew in Germany in the 30s? Because it felt almost as if they were coming for me. And it's rather difficult to define, but there's that fear. And it reminded me of what my dad used to say. He always said to me as a child, You've got to keep a packed suitcase at the door, Margaret, in case you ever have to leave in a hurry. 
And when I heard about the disciplinary, my emotional response resonated with that feeling of fear that clearly was at the heart of what my father felt uh, when he came to Britain. How would you characterise your relationship with him now, with Jeremy Corbyn? It's a very fine line between being pro-Palestinian, the Palestinian cause, which he's always believed in, and being anti-Semitic. And I think he's gone the wrong side of that line. And I think it's a bit scary as well. We've got this sort of growth of populism, whether it's Trump, whether it's Boris Johnson, and now whether it's the cult of Corbynism, which allows these sort of attitudes to emerge. And that's what scares me. Dane Hodge hasn't a clue what it means to talk about deportations, having that suitcase and being prepared to flee. My parents, both of them, were in the Warsaw Ghetto from 1940 until the repression by the Nazis of the uprising in 1943. They were deported. They were deported in Warsaw at the Umschlagplatz. If you go there now, there's a monument to the deportees. And my mother's name, Marla, and my father's name, Zacharias, they're on that monument. You haven't a clue, Ms. Hodge, Dame Hodge. You haven't a clue what you're talking about. You know the suffering? You know the death? My mother used to talk about how she walked the streets of the ghetto and there were dead bodies all around her. She lost all of her parents, both of her parents, all of her family, her sisters, her brother. They were deported. But unlike you, Dame Hodge, they weren't deported to a summer home. They were deported to a death camp. My parents ended up in Auschwitz and Majdanek and slave labor camps. Where are you going, Ms. Hodge? To Switzerland? To your chalet? And you have the gall, the brass, the audacity to compare your life with what my parents endured. You felt it was like 1930s when you got a letter from the disciplinary committee. I wonder, Dame Hodge, when you were in sixth grade and your principal called you down to his office, did it bring back memories of the Holocaust? Or maybe you got a letter from the tax office and they called you down. Did that remind you of the Holocaust? What's the point? What's the relevance? What's the pertinence of dragging in the suffering, the death, the martyrdom of what Jews endured during World, World War II? In this context, except to cheapen and exploit the memory of Jewish suffering as you carry on a blackmail and extortion racket against Jeremy Corbyn. It's disgusting, it's revolting, and if any, if any of the rules that are now being implemented in the Labour Party have any meaning whatsoever, if they have any content,
whatsoever. The first person who should be booted out of the Labour Party is Dame Hodge for trivializing the memory of the Nazi Holocaust and for making wretched, disgusting, repulsive comparisons between herself and what Jews endured during World War II. Speaking of bags and suitcases, Dame Hodge, it's time now to pack your bag, pack your suitcase, and get the hell out of the Labour Party.